A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough not to feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night, especially when there were clouds blocking the moonlight. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I excited my car, I caught the faint whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, but I didn't see anybody outside, so I ignored it and went in. Just got off my shift with a few hours overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 o'clock yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up some time later. I was sure that I heard a noise inside of my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work. I even gave him a spare key. However, he would always text me beforehand and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone screen blinded me. These were the days before phones had light sensors that would dim the screen in the dark, and this particular phone was so bright that I could use it as a flashlight. I squinted my eyes and could make out that it was 9 something in the morning, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread message in my inbox or not. Sat down my phone and called out my friend's name. There was a couple of seconds of silence followed by a loud footfall as someone started moving through the bottom floor of my house. Leaped out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I opened the door and stepped inside. The house had three rooms upstairs, the bedroom that I was in, and a spare with a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway, past my door and into the bathroom. That gave me enough time to open the attic access to my ceiling and hoist myself inside. I had just started to lift myself up when the person came barging out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside the attic. When my bedroom door flew open, I heard the footsteps run into my room and then stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which had boxes stacked in the corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone was hiding, it would be in the first bedroom, because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic, just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they began to climb up. From my vantage point, I could see from about their knees down. They were wearing a dirty pair of blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn out work boots. After a few seconds of looking around my closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room, followed by a scream of frustration. The scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me too much of my stepfather, who would shout in a similar way whenever he lost his temper he would eventually be committed to a mental hospital. The man inside of my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters. As things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over, I stayed hidden in the attic. I left my cell phone by my bed when I ran for the closet. I wasn't certain if I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped started counting slowly. When I reached 1,000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the cops. The first thing I noticed when I excited the closet was the intruder had flipped over my bed, I assume in some attempt to find me. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I used my landline to call the cops. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but that was something I expected. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all the books, pictures and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. 
The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened, and all the boxes and cans had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing that was missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked my house from top to bottom. They found out that the side door had been forced open by a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along the fence line, along with some foil and an empty pen tube, which the police said people often used to smoke meth. So whoever it was had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me that I should stay with friends and family for the rest of that night and get the door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep and moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next few hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence where the police had found the cigarette butts, but I never saw anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house ran a phone cable into the attic, and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. I lived there for another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet, and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. He even kept at it when I moved, except now I go to a crawl space in the back of my closet. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been just a bit slower, or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom, before making his way to my bedroom. This happened back in 2016, and I'm still getting over all of the grief. I haven't really shared this story with anyone yet, but I finally decided to share it. I'm not even going to say where this happened for privacy reasons. Even though I've since moved, I'm really afraid that the people related to those responsible might come after me. Anyway, at the time it happened it was in August, and it was during the evening. My brother and I lived in a small two-bed, one-bath home that sat on ten acres of land. It was what I once considered my dream home paradise. We had everything I could have ever wanted. Good amount of land, two-car garage, a pole barn, and a nice view from our back deck. Now, here's some important details to note. The house itself was a basic square with the back deck on the southwest corner of the house. It was notched in the corner of the house with two walls on either side forming the corner of the house. You couldn't see around the house unless you bent over the railing, and you could only see the west and southwest away from the house. The garage was on the south side of the deck, which was only a few feet away from the deck and the driveway leading to the garage was in front, so you couldn't see anyone coming up the driveway from the back of the house. Anyway, it was the evening. I was sitting on the back deck smoking a joint, and my brother was in his bedroom. I was just outside enjoying the weather and the peace and tranquility of the area. Suddenly, all of that was shattered when I then heard my brother shouting, followed by four loud gunshots immediately jumped up, and I looked around the wall of the house towards the window of my brother's room, which faces the backyard. I looked just in time to see three masked men hopping out of the window. They appeared to be black, and they looked like they were in their late thirties at least, but they were wearing masks, so I couldn't really see their faces. One of them looked at me and froze, almost like he wasn't expecting me to be there. The three then turned and ran around the north wall of the house towards the front yard. Threw my joint out, and I ran inside the house through the kitchen. I then went down the hall to my brother's bedroom. The door was open, and I went inside. When I did so, I stopped dead in my tracks, and my heart then froze. My blood went cold as ice. There on the bed was my brother. He was just laying there facing up emotionless, with his eyes wide open, bleeding to death. Now what I did next probably wasn't very smart, but I ran into the living room, and I grabbed one of my guns. 
threw open the front door just in time to see a blue Chevy Caprice pilling out of the driveway. I fired three shots at them, one missing, one hitting the car's tire, and one hitting the back window. I must have hit one of the guys inside, because I had heard someone screaming from the car. Looking back, this probably wasn't a good idea to do since there was a house right across the street, and I could very well could have accidentally shot the neighbor's house, but I wasn't really thinking that at the time. Anyway, the car sped off, and I ran back inside. I grabbed some towels to try and go cover the wound on my brother's chest, while also calling 911. While trying to cover up the wound, I was telling the dispatcher everything that happened, and I knew that my brother was already gone because he had no pulse when I checked, and he had three bullet holes in his chest, but I think I was just in disbelief at the time. Anyway, since this area has almost no crime rate, you can bet your ass that every sheriff and ambulance in the county was there in about 15 minutes. I had to explain to the detective that was there what happened, while trying not to break down and crying. The sheriff and detective were both in disbelief too, since nothing like this had ever happened in the area in over 37 years. I'll spare you all the little details, but over the next three months, the investigation eventually wrapped up, and here's what I learned. After the police had gone through my brother's phone, they found that he had apparently been getting death threats. Apparently, he had been hitting on a girl that was a gang member's girlfriend. Apparently, the guy had warned my brother to stay away from her, and even after he did, I guess he decided that he still needed to get rid of my brother for good. Apparently, the night before he was killed, he had received a message from an unknown person saying, I'm coming for you. Somehow, the guy found out where we lived and brought two guys with him to do the job. The strangest thing, though, is we lived 40 minutes away from the gang's territory, which was in the city. This guy was so aggravated at my brother that he drove himself and two other guys 40 minutes out into the countryside just to kill him. It really amazes me just how far this guy was willing to go just to make sure nobody ever went near his girlfriend. Now, let me tell you what happened to those three guys. One of them was the one that I had shot as the car pulled out of the driveway, and he apparently died while in the car. The other guy who was along for the job was caught during a traffic stop. Apparently, he was dumb enough to take that same car out the next day, and there was an alert out for it. Now, since there aren't that many sky-blue Chevy Caprices left, it was pretty easy to find. He was arrested, and he was charged with murder. And since the prosecutors where the murder happened are way more strict, he was sentenced to death. The guy who orchestrated this whole thing was actually killed in another shooting in his own city the following week. Yeah, pretty crazy how karma gets to you. I think they all got what they deserved in the end, in my opinion anyways. I did have to go to court for the guy I shot because he had no family apparently and due to some other circumstances, I didn't go to jail. I did get a hefty fine though for dangerous use of a firearm, probably due to the fact that I could have accidentally shot my neighbor's house, and I had to take a gun training class after that, but I didn't care. For almost a year after this all happened, I didn't do anything except mope around my house, and I barely even left the house at all never even went into my brother's room after that. I just left the door to it closed so I wouldn't be tempted to look in it. I was so devastated by what happened that I nearly lost interest in everything. I ended up just packing up all my things and moving out shortly after. Just couldn't stand to be there anymore, nor did I feel safe there anymore after what happened. My brother and I were really close and to lose a loved one so tragically and suddenly in your own home is devastating. It was sad because I really loved that house and my brother. I honestly thought it would be our forever home, but I just couldn't stand to be there anymore. I moved eight hours away, and I haven't been back to that house since, and I honestly don't think I ever will. Do still own the house and the land. 
just don't think I can ever go back. And even though I moved, I still won't ever forget that evening and everything that happened. I'm doing a little better now, and I have someone else living with me, but I'll definitely be scared for life for that event. I live in a small city, and nothing much exciting happens around here, especially in my neighborhood. It's pretty rare to even see a car pass by after 10 p.m. I am a 21-year-old male, and I spend most nights playing video games or reading. I rent a two-bedroom apartment under my parents' house with my sister and her three-year-old son. She doesn't stay home most nights, and my dad works two hours away from home. So generally I'm alone from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. The street I live on gets really dark, and my house is the last one on this end. From my house to the crossroad is about the distance of a football field. The first time I saw the flashlight guy was about a month and a half ago. As I said before, the neighborhood shuts down by 10, so it seemed odd when I went out for smoke and saw a man dressed in all black with his hood pulled up walking down my street, but I brushed it off as I finished my cigarette and went back inside. I went to my bedroom and began reading a book. Fifteen minutes later, I see a flashlight beam sweep through my windows. I should mention that one whole wall of my bedroom is all windows. At this point I was pretty unnerved, so I put down my book and went to go check things out. I didn't see anything at first, so I chalked it up to me being paranoid and sat back down, but it wasn't long before it happened again. By now, I knew that something was wrong and I had a really bad feeling in my stomach. I just wanted to ignore it and hope it would just go away, but I urged myself to be a man and look out the window. Looking outside, I noticed the man from earlier standing about 15 feet away, shining his flashlight directly in front of him. He wasn't moving. I stood there for a couple of minutes, wondering what the hell he was doing, until he swept his flashlight across the hole downstairs of my house. As I said before, no one besides me was home. I was pretty creeped out by this point, and I wasn't sure what to do. So I went upstairs and through the door that separates my apartment from my dad's and went to his room to grab the shotgun. When I got back downstairs and looked out the window, the man was gone. I stayed up for the rest of that night, checking every 10 minutes to see if he would come back. This has happened twice more and he always does the same thing, sweeps his flashlight through my house and then just stands there. I've gotten to where I always sleep with my dad's shotgun next to my bed. My dad says that it's weird and tells me to stay inside whenever I see him and to call the cops if I feel threatened. Anybody that does this kind of thing obviously doesn't have the best intentions, so I understandably feel a bit more threatened every time he shows back up. Fast forward to two days ago. Once again, I'm all by myself. My microwave is broken. So I've been making it a habit to go upstairs and use the kitchen whenever I'm by myself. I forgot to mention that the only door out of my apartment besides going through the garage is in my room. This is important to remember. I made myself some food and went back downstairs. When I got into my room, it was freezing cold. Live in Vermont, so this time of year, always left my door shut and locked and put a towel under it. Use the garage to go in and out of the house because as soon as I open my door, all the heat escapes my room. I always keep the heat cranked all winter because my room is the coldest in the entire house. When I looked at my thermostat, it was shut off, I turned it back up, and I was really unnerved because I had just turned it up about an hour ago. As I said before, I never turn it off because of how cold my room gets. I felt a breeze on my back, and I turned around to see my door partially opened. I quickly close and lock it, but not before I peeked outside, and sure enough, I saw the flashlight guy's light go out as he turns the corner at the end of my street. The next day, I told one of my neighbors about what happened, and they told me just a couple of weeks prior. A woman that lives in the same neighborhood was alone, 
watching TV with her daughter, when someone broke in. I guess they heard the intruder coming through the door and locked themselves in their bathroom and called the cops. Whoever broke in must have taken off when he heard the sirens, because when the police got there, the back door was wide open and nobody was in the house. Don't know who this flashlight guy is or what the hell he went into my bedroom for. But at this point, as you can imagine, it's got me on edge. Since the other night, nothing more has happened. I have been keeping a light on outside and a couple more throughout the house during nights. So it doesn't look like I'm the only one here at night from now on. This happened in April of 2018. I live in a major city in Texas. My apartment complex is gated and in a pretty good neighborhood, but the security isn't the best. Sometimes the gates are left open and anyone can piggyback off someone else entering with an access code. Twice in the past three years, the management has put out notices of vehicle break-ins or other items being stolen off porches. We also have frequent door-to-door -door solicitors, even though there are signs forbidding it. So on this particular Friday, I went to bed around 2.30 a.m. For some odd reason, I was having trouble going to sleep. So I put on a podcast to listen to, and I eventually start dozing off. I heard a clicking sound. I thought it might have been the upstairs neighbors making some noise. I kind of zoned this out, as I'm used to my neighbors staying up late on the weekends. After about 30 seconds, realize the noise is extremely repetitive and getting louder. Then begin focusing on it more intently, trying to isolate what it could be and where it was coming from. Suddenly, it hits me. It's coming from the entrance to my apartment. I lift out of bed and head for the foyer. Identify the noise right away. The lock mechanism is moving back and forth rapidly, as if somebody is trying to unlock the front door. I can hear that an object is being inserted into the lock, and the person is trying to jimmy it back and forth. Instinctively turned around, head to my bedside safe, unlock it with the combination, and pull out my 357 pistol and loaded a 14 round magazine and chambered it with a hollow point round. Then head back to the front door. As I exit my bedroom, I see the lock twist. I immediately aimed my gun, knowing that if somebody came through, I would have to make a split second decision. I decided that if somebody comes through the door, I would give them a momentary chance to retreat. But if they did anything other than that, or enter aggressively, I'm going to shoot and ask questions later. The inside latch lock prevented them from entering. When I first moved in, I remember thinking that the latch lock was a good security measure, and I had gotten into the habit of always keeping it locked when I'm home. In hindsight, this decision saved me from a life or death confrontation. Upon realizing that, I approached the door and looked through the peephole. On the other side were two men and one woman. All three were wearing hoodies, and it was difficult to make out their faces. The men seemed to have objects in their hands, but I couldn't make out exactly what. The two men were talking back and forth, possibly trying to figure out why they couldn't open the door even though they had successfully opened the outside lock. The woman was also talking very loudly. Anyone in the hallway would have been able to hear her voice. She was speaking in another language. The only words I could make out were apartment 250, and she kept repeating that over and over again, like a broken record. Upon hearing that, I start to wonder for a moment if maybe they're just drunk and have the wrong apartment number but that's impossible. To open the lock, you have to have a copy of my exact key or some kind of lock picking device. I've never copied my key or given it to anyone. Here is another thing. Not only is 250 not my apartment number, that apartment number does not exist anywhere in the complex. Standing back from my door, I took a long broom handle 
and jabbed it hard into the surface of the door, letting them know that I'm on the other side. They immediately stopped playing around with the lock and took off running. I debated whether or not to call 911 and decided against it unless they came back. I know that they're going to be long gone by the time anyone gets here and it would have been too risky to try and follow them to get a better description or a license plate. I didn't have enough identifying information. I filed a police report the next day and gave my apartment manager a heads up. They said it was unusual, but they would alert the resource officer and asked for a police presence for the next couple of nights. Nothing ever came of the report, but that wasn't a surprise to me. Nobody else in the apartment has ever reported anything similar happening. One precaution I took was to replace the latch with a smart lock, so it could always be locked from the inside, even when I'm not home. It's crazy to think that a latch was the only thing preventing an armed confrontation between myself and the intruders. They say you don't really know what you'll do in situations like this until it actually happens. If one good thing came out of this, I feel confident that I responded in the right way and was ready for the unthinkable.